Dear Diecast, what have you been doing this week? Hey, Seamus, welcome back. Hi, Paul. So uh, I have not been seeing a lot of extra content on your site. You, you're doing the the whole Final Fantasy thing, um, but then last week you just sent me this really short email saying, can't do the show. Is it like, are, are you moonlighting as Batman or something? Um, sort of. I've been dressing up in a costume and punching people in the f No, I'm sorry to say. I mean, that's my dream, is to dress in a costume and punch people in the face. Whether or not they've committed crimes or not is completely irrelevant to me. Um, uh, we're not going to bring up any particular instances where you may or may not have done that, because that would get into politics realm, but... <laughs> right, right. So, um, we'll just say that, no, I haven't done that. No, this week I was programming. And here I'm torn, because I, I know I want to write about this. I, I know there's uh, a lot of people on the site that are like, this is nice and all, but, like, what if I'm not into Final Fantasy? Because <laughs> we're <you're> like, <laughs> double-dose, double-barreled Final Fantasy posts every week. And if you're not into it, that's not great. And so it would be nice to have some content for those folks. So I was... so. I could do this programming post for them. But if I tell you about it now, then I'll be spoiling the eventual post. And you'll lose all motivation to write about it. And so then you won't ever write about it. A lot of it's already written. But like, do you oh, okay, want to hear about... Well, do you want to hear about it now or would you rather wait for the written version? I would love to hear about it now, but I think you should save it because we have a ton of show saved up from two weeks being off. All right. Well, then you're going to have to talk about some stuff. Okay. So uh, a few months ago, I downloaded Unity and uh, you know, spooled it up and got installed and did a little tutorial and then basically forgot about it because all I was using it for was a client wanted some Unity assets. And so I was importing and exporting stuff through to Blender and stuff. And so it, I didn't really plan on using Unity. I mean, I would, you know, played around with it a bit, but... Um, but now Unity is sending me all their advertising emails about like, hey, do you want the pro version? Oh, yeah. Hey, can we hook you up with the tutorial? Uh, do you want to download a special thing or whatever? Have you been to the asset store? We're having a sale. We're having a sale <laughs> on assets. Do you want to buy these Space Marine models? They're fully rigged and ready to go. Add them to your project now. Only $400. Oh, they come hand. with emotes. Right, they come with emotes, they come with these guns, they even come with some sound effects, and on one hand, $400 is a really good deal for this content. On the other hand, like, how many people on the planet need this? <laughs> <laughs> like, that is a very, sp this is kind of like the thrift, like the used furniture store, just sending out mass advertising hey do you want a popcorn maker <laughs> to everybody in the town it's like that's just too specific to advertise for people that need that know to go and look for it well interestingly i haven't gotten to the level where they're sending me asset store stuff they're still sending me stuff like hey you should learn how to use our tools so that you can apply it to your workflow or whatever okay so uh, a couple weeks ago they sent me a link to a white paper about like the true costs of creating games and launching games or whatever and uh, I was like all right Ooh, sure I'll bite you know like this is a you know a PDF or whatever so it goes on there and they're like you know and your name and your business and you know like how many people you employ and all that you know marketing stuff so they can put you in their marketing registry right 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 and uh, and then they send you download and so I downloaded this thing and started reading through it and uh, the first thing that struck me was that it talks about Ori and uh, or one of these things is talking about Ori. It was a different white paper. They they got me on the hook for like two or three of these things. And uh, so I, I was reading this thing as like Ori made by this small dedicated team and you know of highly creative people and you know here's how Unity worked together with them to make their thing blah blah blah. You know the course of uh, you know a year and a half, seventy people. And I was like wait 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 hang on, seventy people is a small team now? That's crazy. That can't be a small team. And it That's doesn't seem like you need 70 people to make Ori. Now, I mean, like, I can only imagine that there was a core team of, like, five people who were working on it full-time, and then, be, like, geez, over the course of the think... game, 70 people came in and out, you know, contractors through the process. I don't think there are 70 individual frames of animation for Ori, the main character. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all good. Please. Ori's a good It's a rigged character, 2D but... character. Right, right. <laughs> what did the... 
What did the other 65 people do for all that time? I don't know, but so I was struck by that. I was just like, wow, that's a, yeah, that, well, I, it, I mean, it kind of is, I guess. It depends on, like I said, it depends on what they were doing, right? If it was, it was, you know, 65 people and one of them is the accountant, right, that they had on, on call and one of them is their lawyer for signing contracts. I mean, like, who knows, right? Who knows? Right, count everybody, you know, count the guy, you know, you bought that pack of Space Marines on the asset store. Yeah, that was made yeah. by five people. You add them to your credits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what they did. Um, so then I, I was reading through the true costs of creating, launching, and operating a game. And um, it was just, it was very tasteful, but very transparent, at least to me, uh, like marketing copy for, for Unity services like add-on services, right? It's like, well, have you thought about have you thought about the costs of cross-platform compatibility? How are you going to launch on all the different platforms that you're targeting? And, you know, you should make sure that your all your tools are are cross-compatible and have good support. I was like, okay. and they don't ever say in there like be sure to use the Unity software support system or whatever. Like they never say anything about using Unity. But it's just like the subtext right. is just like a riptide throughout the entire thing. You won't be able to do it yourself. It's hopeless. We are your only hope. Give us money. Yeah, yeah. So that was a little. That was a little entertaining. I don't know. I. It didn't. Like I said, it was tasteful. It wasn't like, you know, you're gonna be a scrub and you're never gonna make any money unless you you you, you know, cash in with Unity or whatever. You know, jump on our bandwagon. But um, it was it was kind of interesting that it didn't talk about like style it didn't talk about um you know story continuity it was all talking about like the the costs that they were focusing on were the kind of things that unity could help you solve right it was just right was pretty clear though the one that always gets me is localization like that seems like that's a really hard one <laughs> that one is yeah. hard if you want if you are very particular about the results now you can just yeah. stuff all your game text into it. Let's say, let's say we're doing it. Let's make this easy. Let's take the easy mode and assume we are an indie game and it's text only. We don't have to worry about voice acting. Mm. You put all that text in an external text file and then you just hand it over to the community. Hey, you know, if anybody out there wants, wants this thing in German, you know, somebody that speaks that language translate it and i will add that to the file and you can do that mm -hmm. um but you have no way unless you speak all languages you have no way of auditing the quality of the work being done or yeah. even yeah. that it's being done correctly well you can always use google translate right to back translate and kind of check but yeah yeah, yeah it's a it's a huge problem i remember uh, listening to john blow talk about working on the witness and the huge nightmare that occurred for them doing localization because they did all their own font support and they were very particular about the fonts looking good in all the different languages so it ended up being like oh. full utf-8 character support and, you know like in reverse direction and arabic you know all the different characters and the modifiers and it was just, it was just like this is a huge huge problem if you're just dealing with ascii eh, it's easy that's a solved problem but like if you want to support utf-8 even I would imagine in Unity, that can be problematic because there are some characters that are like yeah. Windows specific characters that don't render correctly in UTF-8 and then, you know, who knows what modifiers and weird things. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, it, it's a scary problem if you want to do it right. It seems like you can do it the free, it's like, it's like incredibly modal. You either do it this scrappy way where it's probably not done right and it's really sketchy. Or the next step up is pay to have it done, in which case it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars. There's no middle solution that's just like 500 bucks. Well, I mean, you could go on Fiverr, right? And like get somebody to do translation for you for probably, you know, two, three hundred, five hundred bucks or something. It's inter that's interesting, I suppose. I suppose. Maybe, and maybe that would be a good translation. I don't know. No, I don't know either. So then the last white paper is uh, this 70 plus tips to increase productivity with Unity 2020 LTS. And like I point this out because I didn't read the whole thing. It was it was fascinating. I kind of skimmed it and it, there were a lot of cool things in there. A lot of them were things that are just like general uh, 3D modeling and like UV mapping and, you know, using the correct tool for the correct process and stuff. But it was interesting that they pointed out like we have 2020 LTS. LTS is long term support for those who don't know the acronym. And uh, so they've got this version of Unity 
and I recall having conversations years ago about like, hey, you know, you, you can play with Unity and it's amazing, but like if you try to get tutorial, like who knows what version they're using and it's always changing. The API is always just in this tremendous flux. It's a maelstrom of different competing standards, even inside the software itself. And uh, so I was very pleased and, and kind of surprised that they've got this 2020 LTS that they're like, look, we've got this version. We're sticking to it. We're not changing anything about it. Long term support, I'm assuming that's like five or 10 years or something where they're going to just like, stick this and nail it down and be like, look, this is what the, this version is. We're going to be releasing new versions, but the LTS is here to stay and you don't have to keep changing the way you're doing things. You know, you can just stick with this one. Yes, I like it too. Um, and I don't remember it like, you know, I messed around with Unity several years ago and I don't remember this this system being used. I do sort of remember it being just like everybody's using the version what you what version of Unity is everybody using? Whatever you whatever version was just released when they downloaded it. When they started working on their project. Right. And so it's all over the place. Uh they've got a multi launcher now in Unity where it's like you can launch projects in many different versions so starting a project is now incredibly daunting because you have to pick oh, no you have to pick from the three available graphics apis no i'm sorry four there's the lightweight which is for it should just call they should call it mobile mobile or the crappiest of laptops but they call it the lightweight mm. render pi pipeline then there's the hdrp which is you know, trying to compete with Unreal with Unreal Engine. You know, it's that's their mm. fancy schmancy mm. high end. Then there's their just regular graphics one that's just like the default that is not either of those two. And then mm. there's a fourth one, fourth one that I can never remember what it is. Um, <laughs> the Arc so you Engine. Gotta, so you got to pick between those four options. But then on top of that, you also pick which version. Like, you, oh, do you want the 2019 or the 2020? And it's not obvious. With it. And I've started a few projects in various versions. And I've already run into problems. There's one of the, there's like a major version out there right now where if you use... It's this obscure problem if you're using a tail renderer, a trail renderer, um, and particle effects, for whatever reason, you will get a whole bunch of null pointer errors in the debug log. And it sometimes maybe you'll also get a crash. I've never gotten a crash. I just get these weird errors that, you know, big red flag errors, right? Error, error, error. And I'm like, everything looks fine. The, the render window looks 100% correct. I don't know what these errors are about. But the point is, I looked up this error, and everybody says, oh, yeah, the solution is just upgrade to this particular version. Well, speaking of weird software versions and errors, I was playing Endless Space 2 on Linux. And uh, I talked about this on the last show. about I booted it up, it played it a little bit, and then it crashed. And uh, I was like, eh, well, you know, I'll get back to it someday. But someone in the comments, I've got a link to the comment if anyone's interested, uh, said, hey, look, if you download a custom version of Proton, then you can sometimes get around these problems. You know, the, Proton is the compatibility tool. It's kind of like Wine that the Steam guys are working on making compatible with, with Windows software and Linux. Okay. And so... Uh, so, so this guy said, hey, I, you can download this, you know, special versions and look it up on the internet and find out which one works with Endless Space 2 and then maybe that'll solve your problem. And so I was like, okay, that, you know, that's fair. Uh, so I went on Steam, I, well, I went on Google and just searched for like Endless Space 2 Linux Proton support or whatever. And uh, it sent me to a Steam thread in the Steam community. And this guy said, and it was posted like eight days ago or whatever. And he's like, hey, I tried all these different versions and Proton 6.21-GE-2 uh, is like, it works for me. I, all the other ones don't work for me. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, how do I get, you know, 6.21-GE2? And so you have to look up like, how do you change the Proton version? And you go into Steam and you can change it. It's got the whole drop down, but like 6.21-GE doesn't show up because GE is a fork of Proton that's not an official oh, in the no. official main branch. And <laughs> so I was like, all right, fine. I'm on Linux. Like I'm I'm can program. I can do an internet. Here we go. 
And so I find their GitHub and I download the thing and then in their GitHub they've got a whole list of like, here's how you install this. It's like, okay, well, you know, take the file and unzip it in this specific folder in your in your directory. And so I do that. And then it's like, but wait, before you run it, you have to install wine and like wine tricks. And then you have to install, like run this custom sudo command in your command line to install the Vulkan drivers. And like, it's this very arcane process. <laughs> so I do all that, you know, download all the things, install the things. This sounds like something that works on one guy's laptop. <laughs> right? Right? I, I know. It's it's this crazy... I, I don't know. It's it's this crazy world of programming that used to be the norm back in... Like, you remember modifying .ini files and, like, changing your oh, boot yeah. parameters so that a game would run? Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was nightmare times. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of adventurous. I, I feel like, it, especially when it's not something that you have to do, like, to get something running that you really need. Like, if this was my tax prep software and I needed to like modify my Windows install so that I could pay my taxes like that would be nightmarish but this is like something I'm doing for fun and if it doesn't end up working it's fine um, for me it would so... be like I came home from work with a new video game that I want to play that I bought with the money I earned you know this was like half my paycheck at fast food this week. I oh, worked for a yeah. lot of hours to buy this. And now I have a giant puzzle to solve to get it to run. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, so you'll be you'll be pleased to hear that it wasn't a complete dream for me. Uh, I installed Proton 6.21-GE-2 and got it into the dropdown so I could select it and ran it and had exactly the same problems that I had before. But... Then I tried using other Proton versions that were already supported in Steam, and one of those actually worked. And I think probably it was in combination with the Vulkan drivers that I had installed, and maybe Wine and Wine Tricks, who knows. But I, like, I got it working, and then I didn't touch anything and just like let it go. <laughs> so everything works, except that it doesn't play any of the movies. Um, so I have to go on, onto YouTube and watch a cinematic whenever I want to see what the cinematic looks like. What are they using, Bink Video? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't think they are, but Darksiders 2, which I picked up on sale, like 80% off, uh, does use Bink Video and also crashes on Linux occasionally, but uh, I have not gone into the, the, the underworld to discover what version of Proton is required to get Darksiders 2 to work. Bink Video, man. That was like a 90s thing that, like, every once in a while, still, 20 years later, you'll see something using Bank, and you'll be like, wait, what, this still exists? It's like <laughs> it was seeing seeing a, a game use Bank video now is like seeing a video cassette in the wild. It's like, whoa, what is this doing here? I think it was, was it Microsoft, thing? wasn't it? Didn't Microsoft, like, develop Bink as an alternative to .mov or whatever, which is, like, Apple's proprietary compression algorithm? I was under the impression that Bink was its own company. It was just, like, third-party middleware. Hmm, yeah, maybe. Before, uh, what, H246 or whatever it is that everybody uses now. Whatever, I thought... I th yeah, I don't know what people use now. I just know you no longer need to install weird third-party clients to watch a video game's cutscenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So that's my that's my software adventure. I also had some adventures in security. I don't know if we want to get into this. Uh, um, I had some a number of verification code uh, shenanigans going on. And, uh, you know, real-life companies trying to verify my ID um, this week. Oh? So... Why so many... Oh, oh, I see. It's it's tax time. It's yeah, tax time. it's tax time. Although not all of these are tax-related. Um, I don't know if we want to skip over this or uh, if you're interested. I, I, I'll hear about it. if it, As long as it goes horribly <laughs> wrong, I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Um, I also don't know if, uh, as a side note, if you want me to mention the names of these these things. You can see them in the show notes, but uh, I don't know if we want them live on air. If we want to associate the podcast with any of these things. Yeah, yeah. You'll just, just say my bank or my, okay. All right. uh, my social so, media account. <laughs> so I was trying to get uh, a payment from someone uh, who I did some work for. And uh, I asked them to pay me through PayPal. And uh, they're like, oh, I can't figure out how to use the link that you sent. Uh, can you just, like, 
have me write you a check or whatever. And so I went on my bank and they use the same <laughs> bank that I do. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They want to write you a check? It's like saying, no, hang on. Can I pay you in doubloons? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, so they use the same bank as I do. And I'm like, you know, can you can you do a, a transfer through the bank? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. That would be fine. Um, so so they send me the transfer, but they send it to the wrong email address. And so now I have to register this email address that I'm I, it's one of the ones I use, but it's not the one I use for transfers to this bank account. And uh, so I have to register this email address with my bank account's transfer service, which is separate from the bank. So there's like the bank and then there's this separate transfer thing that's like, you know, handles transactions or whatever. It's this online check cashing, whatever. And uh, so I go on there and I say, OK, I want to register my email. And and uh, they say, OK, well, you know, we're going to email you a, a verification code. And um, so fine. And, you know, it doesn't you remember back in the old days when someone said, we're going to send you an email and like, bam, it happened. It was in your inbox. It's not like right. that anymore for whatever reason. They've got some sort of script that's like going every minute or something. Yeah, it's still like that with some platforms like Steam. Man, if I request something from Steam, boom, like I hit send and ding, I'll get an email. If I do it with Microsoft, it, they put it, I think they actually put it on a boat and they, they ship it, they, <laughs> they ship it via some sort of ocean bound shipping. They, they take it down to the docks in Cuba and like have it go on one of those fishing boats that's going to the U.S. <laughs> yes. That is so, an improvised boat. Yes. <laughs> Ad hoc shipping. So, so I have them send me the code and it arrives in my mailbox and it's like, warning this code expires at blah 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 and I look at the time and it's like that's right now like does this code expire right now is it is that how this works and so I copy the code out and like paste it into the thing and hit okay and it's like oh no that's 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 an invalid token and I was like what like you guys just sent me the email I what do you mean it's an invalid token and so I like tried a couple times and like type it in manually maybe it's like this weird thing where like the the numeric characters are a weird encoding problem i don't know and but i type it in manually no no it doesn't it's it's just plain numbers it's you know zero to nine and uh it doesn't like it invalid token so i say so have them send it again invalid token i do this you know for for a while i i probably like 10 minutes 15 minutes i'm like sending myself codes they always say they've expired exactly at the time that they arrive and uh, so i finally call up the support and i'm like hey guys i need to add this thing to my thing and like it keeps saying I have an invalid token and the lady was very nice, right? I mean, like that's her job is to be nice about these things and I'm not being a jerk. So like we're having a nice conversation, but it's like, I, I don't know why this is such a problem. No one else has problems sending me verification codes. So uh, we discover that um, it doesn't work on your desktop. You have to do it through the mobile app. You can't, can't do it <laughs> through a, a browser for whatever reason. Like the invalid token wasn't saying that the code was invalid. It was saying that like, something about my browser or my computer or my internet connection like couldn't give them a valid token for security or something and it's just like this is so insane like i control this email address it's on my server it's not even like at google.com it's like on my web hosting so like i can get right. these emails they're not going anywhere else like you're the guys who are telling me that i don't i have a security problem but you're the guys who are preventing me from like getting logged into this thing. And like, and they've already sent you the money. So like the money is sitting there and you won't put it in my account because you guys have a security problem with your, like your security's dialed up too tight. So it, it was just, that was just crazy. So I went on the mobile app. And yeah. I, I've, I, I've noticed that problem too with banks is that their security going in is often very lax bordering on comedic and their security going <laughs> out is paranoid um bordering on fanatical and so the, yeah. you wind up you wind up with your money getting wedged in their system and it's like well if i'd known it was going to be a pain in the ass ahead of time you know if it was like this on both ends I would have tried to put it in, run into these problems, and then gone, oh, I'll just use PayPal like people do today instead of dealing with an ancient bank. <laughs> right. And, but, and PayPal has 
transaction fees. And like, I'd rather right. have no transaction fees. This bank thing doesn't have transaction fees, but it's a total nightmare. So like, that's why they're the transaction fees because I'm willing to pay them, you know, the 3% or whatever so that I don't have to put up with this nonsense. Exactly. Because, yeah, it only takes one of these setbacks uh, before that 3% can quickly, you know, when you talk about billable hours, it can very quickly cost you um, more time than you have to, than you would have lost if you just paid PayPal. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Banks, you got to get your, you got to act together. Um, and then I was going on, I was trying to log into a, a, make an account with a social media thing and uh, it wouldn't let me create the account. And I was like, oh, okay, I know what's going on. It's my browser. It must be my browser. So I go on my phone to do it. Um, but <laughs> the um, provider for my phone service will not allow me to install the software to do this, do this thing, right? It's like, oh, well, this, we don't, we don't recognize this thing. And it wasn't that like, it doesn't exist. It like put up a message saying like, we're not currently serving this software on our platform at this time. It was just like, oh guys, please, <laughs> why, why are you doing this? So, uh, so that was kind of annoying. And then to top it all off, I was doing my taxes and uh, I, was, I was talking to my tax professional. I, I hired somebody to do it for me because um, I've got complications in my finances and stuff, you know, self-employment and all this stuff. And uh, so they're like, hey, I need your some information from the IRS. And for international guys, IRS is Internal Revenue Service. It's the federal government's tax system. And um, so I had made super an friendly. account. Oh, yeah, very, very friendly. Um, they really want you to pay your taxes, but they really don't want to tell anyone how much taxes you've paid, which is kind of like, and we've talked about this before on this show, like I would rather just everyone be able to access my information so that I can access my information rather than no right. one be able to access my information and make it a nightmare for me to get to it. Because like on the balance, I'd rather just be able to get to it. And if someone else can see how much taxes I paid, fine. I don't care. But that is not their system. People, their system is people like that don't you need people that make a lot of money and don't pay a lot of tax don't want this information getting out. And they generally have a lot of money. And so they're like the the entire system needs to be locked down for this tiny handful of people that are really sensitive about it. And it's like, can't they pay extra? Exactly. Just have them pay extra to lock down their account and then everyone else's is on the open. Yeah. Oh okay. well. Look at yeah. So, so I was reminded of the skit that Loading Reddit Run did about like five factor authentication, where you have to go, and, like you know, call in to the thing, and then they send over a dermatologist to check the skin tag on your back, and like, <laughs> <laughs> they, and that guy gives you the code for a Chilean number station, and yeah, it reads off the verification code for you, because. Because, like, literally, there was these, there's all these factors. And you go on there, and it's like, okay, I'm going to log on. It's like, hey, you haven't logged in in a while. we got to verify that you're really who you say you are. So we're sending you a code to your email address. Fine. Everybody does that nowadays. Two-factor, fine. So I take the number, paste it in, goes through. And they're like, okay, great. You got the code. Uh, now we need you to, like, enter your social security number or whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, all right. Federal government, fine. And, you know, enter that in. And then like, okay, great. Now, uh, do you have a phone with a video camera? <laughs> I'm like, oh no, <laughs> it's getting, it's getting crazy now. They're like, okay, we're emailing you this code and you got to open it on your phone and then like, or texting, we're going to give us our, your phone number. We're going to text you code, you click on it and then it's going to like open a web page. And on the web page, it's going to take a live video of you and like analyze your face to make sure that like, <laughs> I don't know, what, what are they checking for? Like. Is it, do they have images? Oh, no, 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 before that. Okay, yeah, before that, they had me upload uh, photos of my driver's license. And so they're like, you know, pictures front and back of your driver's license. Okay, fine. Then they have you do a live video and it analyzes your face and checks it against your driver's license to make sure that you're the guy who's on the driver's license. And I was like, well, like if I'm uploading a video, like a picture of my driver's license, it would be really easy for me to just like modify that maybe they've got right. records of it so that they check it against my name you know they've got like my photo it goes into a registry somewhere i don't know so they, i've got i upload the photos of my driver's license and then they do this video thing and like videos my face and like change all these weird colors and doing scan thing or whatever and uh and then it's like okay now we're gonna do a credit check on you and so like you have to like do the blah 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 and i was like okay fine like this keep amazing. going you know keep pressing okay and, uh, and like I press the OK button and it just like sits there and it's like, OK, verifying whatever. And it just like spins 
forever. And like, so I go to bed, you know, I come back in the morning and it's like, oh, your login is, is, is unverified now. And so you get to start all over again. So I go back through, I upload my oh. driver's license again. I do this face scan thing. And now the face scan thing is like, oh no, we don't think uh, your face scan doesn't work anymore. Like you don't, it's not working so well. Why don't you try changing your lighting? And I was like, I, I don't know what you, you tried to sit in direct light. So I'm like sitting in the sunlight and like the camera can see my face. Like it worked before. I don't know what's working now. And so I try over and over and over again. Finally, it's like, oh, we're sorry, but uh, you tried too many times and it didn't work. So, uh, oh my gosh, I guess this you'll have to nightmare. call up. You'll have to call up uh, our live support line or whatever. And uh, and I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to go back to my bank's website, which I'm already logged in on <laughs> and just like download the information off of there because I got the transactions on both ends. So I'm just going to get the information from the bank. You guys can have fun with this. And so now, like, every day, this, this, and it's not even, like, through the IRS, it's like this other third-party ID verification company or whatever is emailing me, like, hey, guy, you know, you're almost done logging in. You're almost done. You can, you just click the button, you're almost done. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You guys, you guys are pulling my leg. I've done this already. Like, you're going to make me start all the way over again, and then you're going to tell me that the, you know, face thing doesn't work and you need to talk to a live professional, and they're going to try to sell me a, a condo or something. I don't know what's going to happen. So, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm moving all those to spam, and uh, I'm done, done with that. So that's my that's my verification code hijinks stories. I don't know what what it is, but people just they don't know how to do verification codes anymore somehow. What gets me about this is we know that the U.S. federal government's back end still to this very day runs on COBOL. Um, oh, yeah. they're they're yeah, they're their tax system. So the back end is COBOL. And the front end is this Rube Goldberg contraption that doesn't work. Oh my god. The, the thing, you think of that Loading Ready Run skit, I think of the movie Brazil. That's my oh, reference yes. point for this. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, very, uh, yeah, not as many is... um, attractive actresses, but yeah, same feel. Right, this is, this is a Terry Gilliam movie happening to you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that is horrible. And, well, and, okay, so to top all this off, like, the tax guys sent me this request saying, like, hey, can you get me the, you know, this info? And I sent back saying, look, um, it came through you, like, the payments came, like, were from your company, right? Like, I had you wire the funds directly into my bank account, but it came through you. So you, the government wires you the funds, and then you wire it into my bank account. Um, can you just look at your records? Like, why go through all this nonsense? <laughs> Like, you have the numbers. I've given you all these numbers. I'm trusting you. Like, there's no way in which that you can be able to compromise me any more than you already are. You've got all my information, all of my personal records, all my bank account numbers. Like, I haven't given my PIN number, but you could probably figure it out. Like, you could call those guys up and be like, oh, you lost this PIN and change my PIN if you wanted to. Like, I trust you with this stuff. Can you just look at it? And they're like, no, no, it's a security problem. We can't look at the transactions. I'm just like, why? Why is this so stupid? I had the same problem with um, with a mailbox that I owned back in the 90s. You know, federal government, once again, it was, uh, I lived in a very small town that did not have mail delivery service. So you had to go to the post office. Hmm. But you, but so you have to pay for a post office box. Okay. And you have to use the key. So I, um, one, you can only get your mail um, during um, business hours. But if you no, work it's during... indoors and like it's locked or whatever. Right, right. It's a secure building. But it's like, so I can only get my mail when I'm at work. So the oh, only no. day a week I can get my mail is on a Saturday. And I left my keys at work and my post office box key was on the keychain and i'm like hey i you know i don't have the key but i can prove to you i'm the one that bought the box i can i am carrying all of my f identifying and no no i couldn't pot it for security reasons i can't possibly let you in and i'm like but well, wait the key it prove the key is the tool that proves someone is me <laughs> not the other way around <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it's like if somebody else gets the key, key they're not going to come in here with my with my id and my face <laughs> right exactly 
it's easier to steal the key than to fake my entire collection of identification. And the whole point of it is to keep people from taking my mail. But no. Oh, man. No, I, I could not get my mail because I did not have the key. And then, and then wow. she, and then you know, next Saturday she gets an attitude with me because my my mailbox is so full because it's got two weeks of mail in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a I'm a direct descendant of Lysander Spooner, one of the guys who who started their own mail service, and the federal government shut him down. So, one of these days we'll get our revenge, Seamus. We'll get our revenge. <laughs> Thank goodness they shut him down. Oh, imagine the nightmare the world that we'd live in if he'd been allowed to deliver things to people. Spooner mail, yeah, that'd be a real disaster. What if he delivered mail and you didn't have the key? Oh, I shudder to think. <laughs> right, mailboxes don't have keys on them. Like, any old joker can... In fact, I've had mo instances, multiple instances, where people steal things out of my mailbox and put things into my mailbox that I don't want in there. And, like... That's not that's not a security problem, apparently. <laughs> right. Right. That was the other thing that bothered me. Like, if I had a mailbox, this wouldn't be a problem. This is only a problem because you're forcing me to have a have a locked mailbox that I don't want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you just can you just have an outdoor mailbox, right? The one that doesn't have a lock on it? I don't I don't care if someone steals my mail, it's just junk mail anyway. Right, right, especially, I was, you know, I was, like, 25 years old. Like, <laughs> no, but I don't have anything of value. The only thing I ever got of value, I, rem I remember the frustration was, I had ordered Duke Nukem 3D through the mail. And so, it was really important that I get my mail. Um, yeah. And that's the only thing I cared about. The rest was just bills, and you can pay them whenever. Yeah, nobody cares about that stuff. Well, speaking of things that nobody cares about, I was uh, I was using my headphones. I got these wireless headphones. I've had them for a few years, and um, I was using them, and then they just like stopped working. I was using them one day, and you know, set them down, picked them up again, push the button to turn it on. And I don't know what it is about this particular model year, but it seems like there's this whole like phase where things just had one button on them, and you like hold the button down, and it like turned yes. on, and then like. You hold it, or like press it twice, and it does something, or you know. Yeah, um, yeah. You press it once to turn it on, press it twice to pair it, long press it to unpair it, triple long press it to to change the volume, and it's like, can can I pay the extra twenty three cents and get a second button for some of this functionality? Yeah. Or a power switch, at least, you know, so I can, like, actually turn it on and off without sitting here for like five seconds trying to turn it off so the battery doesn't drain. Right. Yeah, not good. So anyway, I, I hold the button down and instead of saying, like, device powering on in my ear, it just doesn't make any sound. And uh, so I'm like, all right, well, I guess it's finally bit the dust. So, you know, take it downstairs, put it in the pile of electronics on the electronics workbench. Um, the graveyard. But then, you know, a couple of days go by and yeah, yeah, put it down there. I mean, I mean, kind of intending to, like, you know, take a look at it, but I'm, I know it's hopeless, right? Like, there's no way I'm going to get this thing working again. So I put it down the workbench. And, uh, you know, days go by and then, you know, the kids are all on all the computers and someone's using my headphone to talk to my wife, playing the computer games and they're, well, they're playing Deep Rock together, obviously. And, uh, so I'm sitting here, I'm like, I want to, you know, listen to a movie and, uh, it'd be really nice if I had my wireless headphones. So I'm not, I don't have my wireless headphones. So instead of listening to the movie, I'm going to go down and see if I can get them working again. So I get out my screwdriver and start taking this thing apart, and you know, it, it comes apart fairly easily. It's not too bad. Sometimes they, they glue these things together with super glue or whatever, and they're just impossible right. to get apart without breaking. But um, these are nice enough that they actually have little screws, and you take the screws out, and they kind of pop apart. And um, I'm pulling this thing apart, and you know, looking at things, and you can see all the little lights in there, and you can turn it on and off, and like the, the noise suppression still works. So I know that there's power in the battery, but um, for whatever reason, it's not pairing anymore. So I keep pulling this thing apart, and I finally get down to the battery, and it's, you know, one of these little lithium things, and um, pull the battery out. It's a little hard to get out, and so I, I pull it out and uh, look in there. I was like, okay, well, you know, there's some electronics behind it. And then I look at the back of the battery, and there's this adhesive strip on it. And it's like this whole pad, right, where you stick it on. And so instead of, like, having a battery mounting bracket or something, they just put some adhesive on it and then just, like, stuck it to the circuit board. Um, except when you stick it to the circuit board, it's not sticking to, like, the board, it's sticking to the components that are sticking up above the board. So, and including the sticky tape on the back of the battery is 
a little IC chip that has just come off the board because it was stuck to the battery. Oh no! <laughs> oh, come on! And it's one of those little dead bug, you know, like eight pins, four on each side, the little legs sticking out, yeah, and yeah. you can see that one of them has been bent a bit where it, like, worked loose, and then, like, I, I imagine just from, like, using it, you know, and setting it down on the table or whatever, the battery broke this IC chip and broke all the solder leads off and, like, you know, pulled it free. So, like, here's this this thing that's broken because they couldn't be bothered to spend, like you said, you know, the extra 12 cents to put a modern, like, a real mounting bracket on this battery. So I'm like, oh, no, like, this is clearly the problem. Like, it's right there. And, uh, and I don't have, like, a little, you know, soldering, you know, like, super fine soldering tool or whatever. I just got one of those big old fat soldering irons, you know, that you use for, like, soldering through hole stuff. Right, right. Yeah. And so, and this whole chip is probably, like, three millimeters by two millimeters. Like, it's one of the really, it's really small ones. It's not a surface right. mount, which would actually be better. If it's a surface mount, then you can just, like, put the pads down and then, like, stick the soldering iron right on the back of the surface mount device, and it'll just solder it right back on. But um, then it wouldn't come off in the first place. So, like, I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, all right, well, you know, I, I knew it was going to be impossible to fix, but it's not going to hurt anything if I try, right? And like, you know, it's already broken, so I can't break it anymore. So I take this thing and I set it on the thing and I'm trying to, you know, position it around and I put a bunch of solder on the pads and then, like, it's all globbed together and it's, like, getting all over other components on the board. I'm trying to, like, scrape it off and I don't have any solder tape or whatever, you know, to wick the extra the solder wick, off. So I'm yeah. like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm like scraping it off with a tip and then like, you know, wiping it on the sponge and trying to, you know, like clean up this this hack job that I've done. And then I, you know, put the thing down on there and just kind of like mush it all in with solder and then like try to scrape away the extra solder. And uh, I'm finally I finally get to the point where I'm like, well, I can't do a better job than this. Like it it's either fixed or it's really broken now. So, you know, put the soldering iron away, push the button and wouldn't you know it. The thing works again. <laughs> nice. I was just that so startled. I yeah, I was just like, what? How? How does this? I don't want to look at it too close. It's just like I don't know what I did. I I mean, I I know what I did, but it wasn't good. <laughs> it's, I did a very bad thing to that circuit board, but it works again. It's, so it's like when you take a test, you don't know the answer, and so you just oh, guess yeah. on all the ABC questions, and then it comes back and you go to B, and you're like, what? <laughs> Right, right, exactly. So, like, I don't, I know I didn't do that right, uh, but somehow I, I got the right answer anyway. Good. Statistically, an extraordinarily unlikely outcome. <laughs> right. So, so I was happy about that. I'm and the sorry. last thing I got to talk about this week is uh, Patreon sent out a census. It was the, the yearly census. I don't know if you got this too. I got it, and I was like, I should probably take part in that. But, you know, I was programming, and it's just, it is really hard when I'm coding. It is so hard. You know, my 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 brain is in a lot of different gears. You know, I'm writing words and oh, time to check my comments. Change gear, no problem. Oh, time to go, you know, t time to get the post ready for the week. Time to do the podcast. That's fine. I can switch between all these tasks. But if I switch over to programming, I just get stuck in that gear and I don't get back out of it. And it's like, just keep coding, coding. It's like, oh, here's an important thing. You're going to miss a deadline. Important things are going on. I'm like, no, no, I have to fix this bug. I have to figure this out. No, I'm in the middle of four different things. <laughs> yeah. I have four different systems in my brain at the same time. I'm not putting these down. I mean, get back here. It would take me the better right, part of an hour. Right. Screw it all. Yeah, it burn. I, I know. Right there with you. I'm right there with you. I, uh, I did, was not programming at the time, so... Instead, I decided to just take the Patreon census. I mean, how bad could it be? Spoilers, oh, no. I didn't get through it. It was not good. Because cause they're, like, I don't know what they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out, like, what their competition is or something. But um, it just went on and on and on. The thing that I've noticed about Patreon is they're, they're trying to figure out, well, what do we need to do next? How do we grow the platform? What is the next thing to do? And from my point of view, there's nothing to do. You built it. It's done. It works. All you can do here from here is add cruft that nobody wants or needs. Uh, like Patreon, like the uh, system to add on gear where you could like sell t-shirts and merch and oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
that should have been that should have been you know at the time i was like does this make sense and then the more i looked at it i was like no this should have been another company a third party company should have offered mm -hmm. this service something standalone and, and they do there are many companies that offer that service right and it's like patreon you can't compete somebody else is already doing this really really well you can't compete with them and now you've added this craft and now you've got to support it because people are using it and so like stop adding crap you're just adding things that you yeah. will do you're going to have the microsoft windows of support platform where it does everything lousy or not microsoft microsoft office the worst version of all of these different features all bundled together yeah yeah, so I tell was, me about this. I, the, the one piece of yeah, the one piece of feedback that I had for them was I want to be able to search my own posts, and they're like for whatever reason, there's no way to do that. It's it's just so incredible to me that that they've got this database and I can't run queries against it. Like it, there's no way to get in there. I don't I don't understand. So that's that's just baffling. And I think maybe they've added it recently or something, but like. It wasn't there for a very long time and i'm still sore about it if that's the case so anyway i go in there and it's like okay well you know what what uh platforms do you use and which ones do you post videos on and which one and how often you post videos and then if you were using these platforms here's a bunch of questions about uh, youtube and about uh twitter and about tw TikTok and about uh, insta fam or whatever i don't know only fan that was one of them is only fans of like that's a porn oh. site isn't it like i don't that's what I thought i'm not it was. using that yeah so so apparently they're trying to compete with only fans too for whatever reason and uh, it was just like i don't like i don't understand why you guys think it's okay to waste my time with all of these questions when like number one you guys know how much money i'm making like it's 12 bucks a month that's not it's not worth your time. It's not worth my time. Like it's worth neither of our time to even talk about this, right? Like you don't care what my opinion <laughs> is because I'm not bringing you any revenue, and I don't care what you think because you guys obviously have your own plan. And you're gonna do it whether I like it or not. So this is like, like the like this is like the IRS auditing a street busker. It's like come on, buddy. There's a dollar twenty five <laughs> right. in the hat. Let's just let let's just let's just walk away from this. Yeah. Why why are you doing this? So, uh, so I gave up after a while. I was like. I, there's some feedback I want to give you guys, but it's clear that you're not going to ask for the feedback that I want to give you. And there's a bunch of things that you want to know from me, and like none of it is is going to be what you want to hear, right? It's all like, no, I don't care about your platform. No, I'm not interested in being like. What would make you like? How does how does Patreon make you feel? Does it make you feel like an older father? Does it make you feel like a friend or or like a lover or like you know? How was your relationship with Patreon? It's just like. Uh, no, it's not any of those things. It's a tool like that. I've I've completely objectified your service and I don't care to <laughs> right. unobjectify it. Right. It's like a wrench, you know, a really big, annoying wrench that I keep around sometimes. So anyway, I, I gave up on it. It was it was kind of sad, but uh, I wish there was an easier way to provide feedback without going through all of their crazy hoops. I should have taken the census. I'm probably the one they wanted to hear from, but uh, the the window on that thing was tight. It was like a week. It was like a week, and they closed yeah. it. Yeah, and, and you know, it would have taken you like all day yeah. or whatever. I, I don't know why, but oh yeah, I wouldn't have made it then. I would have gotten two minute. You know, I I went. I looked at it and I expected it to be a two minute thing. So if I'd gotten fifteen minutes into it and there was no end in sight, yeah, that that would not have worked out. Yeah, they've got a progress bar, but it's one of those Windows copy file progress bars where, like, you get halfway through and then it just stops moving. Oh, that feels so bad. Yeah, not good. All right, well, do we have time for mailbags this week? We've got a bunch of them. We do. We do. Let's do a few at least. Okay. Dear Diecast, what's one slash some of your favorite choices that you've made in role-playing games? And what do you think are the best games in the, of the genre in this sense? All the best. Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, um, this is a toughie because some, we can divide choices up into two categories, Ch choices that were really good while you're making them and choices that were really great later. Once you saw how they paid mm, off. Mm, right. Um, the one where you decide if you want to side, um, in, in Mass Effect 2, you want to decide if you want to side with 
one side of the geth or the other that was a fascinating sort of philosophical question to ponder hey do we destroy these guys because they're our enemy and that's totally fair or we can just reprogram them so they'll be on our side well we're okay with destroying them so wouldn't sparing them be the less evil option but that feels like the more evil option and so mm, you you've got right. to you, right is it like brainwashing somebody, what is it right it's well they're they're robots so you're reprogramming them um and uh and you know just pondering what that's like and what that you know what would that be like if i'm on the receiving end would i rather die or be reprogrammed to believe the opposite of my beliefs mm. and it was an interesting thing but like you know there was no big payoff later that decision was interesting for having made it but then there are other decisions that once you make them <laughs> down the road you dealing with the consequences is interesting like if at the beginning of mass effect 2 that decision comes back and it's like well you chose to reprogram the guests so now you have to work for cerberus whereas if you didn't <laughs> then you get to be like no i'm never going to work for cerberus you know i'd rather die and then it's just the end of the game it's the end of the series i mean I, that'd be interesting right um th that was mass effect 2 <laughs> that you made the decision so you were already yeah. working for cerberus oh no oh uh, retroactively retroactively you die at the beginning um some of the many of the decisions in the walking dead were very great to make but then later you you know it's like a magic trick you suddenly realize that your decision doesn't matter mm. um you make you know you it gives you choice of a or b and then later somebody says something and you realize oh, that answer would work regardless of whether i chose a or b so they mm, sort of are right. deliberately not no i understand that was a budgetary you know just to keep the scope of the game down they had to do stuff like yeah, that yeah yeah keep the re-merge the timeline so you don't get this huge branching problem right but it did sort of once you become once you negate a couple of really important like if i agonize over a decision and it really hurts to make um you know, cut off your left arm or kill your dog kind of decisions. Once you make that choice, you know, let's say I choose to kill my dog. And then the next scene, I there's a horrible accident that rips my arm off. And I realize, huh, I see what you're doing here. <laughs> the, the artifice is laid bare. And I realize it's not just that the decision itself didn't, the decision mattered to the story. But I agonized over it for no reason. Mm, the, right, the th right. What I was looking to get out of making the decision, I did not get. Um, yeah, so that is the... So, th yeah, that's what I would say for the, for the decisions. It's easier to make a decision interesting in the moment than it is to have it pay off later. But it feels better if it pays off well later. Uh, I, yes, like, it on does. retrospect, I suppose. Yes, yeah. It does feel better later, but that's harder to do. And it also can kind of put you in a tight spot if, like, a decision you made kind of flippantly and off the cuff at the beginning of the game, suddenly at the climax, you know, it turns out that that was really important for some reasons. Like, what? Wait, why? I I would have made a different decision if I thought that this mattered. Right. Eh. That that's what I have to say about choice in games. We don't see it as much. We had a few games there back in 2014. It was like big choices all the time. Everybody's making big choices, big choices. What are you gonna choose? And it was all these binary choices, and that was like a craze for a couple of years. And now you don't really see that much anymore. Mass Effect, Walking Dead, I think Bioshock Infinite did some of that. Yeah, Bioshock Infinite messed around with it, and there was one other game that was doing big choices. And uh, that all kind of came and went real quick, and now and now everything's about the the static narrative. There's no expectation these days that you're going to impact the narrative. Mm. Well, I think a lot of the the promise of big choices was kind of subverted. Like you said, a lot of times they read they combine those later on down the down the story path, and so it doesn't actually matter what your choices were, or they may matter for a short period in the game, but then it. It washes out over time. It was like a bridge that they burned. And even if <laughs> you were not the one to burn, even if your team isn't the one to burn it, 
other game developers burned this bridge and now players are just not humoring you anymore. <laughs> you know, like they get to a choice and they stop thinking of it of in-game terms and they immediately get yanked out of the game and like, well, is this going to matter? What's the bet? Which gives me more XP? And they start thinking of getting a meta thing because they've been burned too many. It's like the audience itself was ruined for that sort of content more than more than any particular developer. I feel like my favorite choices in a game for RPG, like choices that really mattered, um, happen in Dwarf Fortress Adventure Mode, where like the choices aren't these deep philosophical questions, but they really do have impact on the entire simulation. And, like they really matter. In that sense so i've uh that's the place that i've been the most impressed yeah yeah and, and in any sort of non-scripted game like that every choice you make matters <laughs> like you are constantly making choices you play don't starve and uh yeah you are making a non-stop series of choices that completely matter mm. but they're not big telegraphed have a conversation with people kind of choices. They're just like, do I put this object down and pick this one up? Which one of these is better? <laughs> yeah. Oh, while, while I'm in... pondering it, I realize the sun went down and I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. Although in Dwarf Fortress, that's why I bring up Dwarf Fortress Adventure Mode, because you can actually have very rudimentary conversations with people and, you know, invite people on your adventure and later they get killed and you go back and talk to their beloved ones who are now bereaved and, like, Oh, wow. Those things can really happen in the game and like it's like I said, it's very rudimentary, but with mm -hmm. that very rudimentary level of engagement, there's also this very deep commitment to like really honoring the things that you say and do. Um, we could technically do one more if it's short. Okay, here we go. Hey, Seamus and Paul. I recently got around to playing through Hellblade, Sayuna's Sacrifice. I've owned it for a couple years and there's no real reason for me not to play it any sooner other than a gigantic backlog of games. I really enjoyed it and can easily understand all the accolades the game received when they came out. Are there any games, either critically or socially well received, that you found your way to after all the hype had died down that actually lived up to said hype? Thank you, Chris slash Gatsu. Thank you so much, Chris. I have a lot of, like, I have so many games that fall under this that it, they sort of blur together. Like, I have trouble remem remembering a particular one, because it happens all the time, you know? I'm like, I can't play this at launch because I'm playing some other game at launch. And then a few months down the road, I pick it up, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is as good as everybody said it was. Um, I think I came to the Batman games late. Yes, I did. I came to the Batman games like, I didn't play any of the Batman games until the second one was already out. And, boy, I really... I mean, they're some of my favorites now. Mm. I just, I really love those friggin' games. And I guess I slept... I, you know, it sort of blurs together now. I don't think of it as having slept on it, because now, now I play them pretty regularly. But, yeah, I, I did sleep on those. I did come to them very late. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, I guess, I guess I just need to think of more examples. Um, the Hitman games, uh, the Hitman games were way into their franchise before I played one of them. And that turned out to be pretty good. I really enjoy Hitman. Uh, World of Warcraft. Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto, I played, well, I played the first one back when it was, you know, the, the old 2D ones. I played it when it was in, like... Share, like the shareware version or whatever. So I don't think I slept mm -hmm. on that. Grand Theft Auto 3, I didn't play until it had been out for a while. Uh, my brother came to live with me for a while. I forget what the deal was. He was home from the Navy and needed a place, but he got to the Navy like in the mid-90s. I don't remember, but for whatever reason, Patrick needed a place to stay for a, for a few months that turned into like a year. And he brought his PlayStation with him. And I got introduced to a lot of games there. That's where I, that's where I discovered Final Fantasy for the first time. Mm -hmm. So there, Final Fantasy X, you know, <laughs> I guess I slept on that one for, you know, the first 10 entries <laughs> of the series, you know, the first 10. <laughs> um, and Grand Theft Auto 3, I didn't play until I was like a year old. So those are some examples of games that I played later in their lifespan, and they turned out to be pretty good. World of Warcraft, like you said, that's a huge yeah. one culturally. Yeah, and I came to that one years late. Um, I think some of the 
expansions were already out but before i ever you know got into the game like i complained about the inconvenience of the game and the old timers just laughed at me They're like oh you have no idea what it was like at launch <laughs> you're spoiled and i'm like i don't know what to tell you man it's still inconvenient the fact that it was more inconvenient <laughs> in the past doesn't really change that right you guys all have stockholm syndrome this is still bad <laughs> right exactly yeah so those are my examples do you have any you you don't play games at launch so this would be like every game you've ever gotten into well i mean a lot of the games that you talked about i have played i played world of warcraft at launch um I played, well, I, yeah, I, the games that I do get into, often I play at launch or early access or whatever, and then the games that are popular, I, I usually don't play games that are popular just because I, I'm kind of a hipster, sorry everybody, but, uh, you know, I don't want to be, like, jumping on the bandwagon stuff that everybody thinks is cool, it's like, man, I'm too cool for stuff that people think is cool, I guess. I'm just a, I'm just a real snob. Sure. <laughs> It doesn't even sound weird to me. Like, yeah, I don't want to play it. Everybody else is already playing it. What observation can I make that isn't going to be like, oh, I think this game, I think it's a, I, I think it just goes on a little too long. And it's like, yeah, 50,000 other people have all said that exact same thing. Like, I could totally understand the, the desire to want to avoid something that's really, really popular just because there's going to be nothing novel to say about it. And you kind of know what you're getting already. Right, right. It's like going to Disney World during the busy season. It's the worst time. <laughs> Everybody's ever. already here. They're all having fun. Why do I need to be there? No, I'm like an introverted thing, maybe. Right. right. Yeah, isn't that weird? Even as a even as a cultural movement, I feel cramped if I'm there with a bunch of other people enjoying it all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be doing the desire to be doing what everybody else isn't doing. Mm. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I'll get that in a multiplayer game. If everybody, you know, we're doing whatever, everybody else goes right. We're playing some game and I'll have the urge to go left just because nobody else is doing that. And so that's not being covered. Uh, the exception being left for dead where, you know, if everybody else goes right, you need to go right. <laughs> you got to you gotta stick together. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, you know, uh, ignoring that, like, you know, any kind of like uh, online shooter capture the flag or team-based game whatever my team is is do i don't want to bunch up with everybody else i want to be doing something unexpected right right everybody else is sticking on the lanes in a moba and you're off jungling right so that's all i have to say about that well paul i hope we've done a show i'm going to be totally honest i barely been watching the clock and uh yeah, all these topics were yours. So this was kind of your show, <laughs> and I just rode your coattails this week. So thanks for that. Yeah. Well, and thanks to everybody who wrote in. Uh, if you have a question for the, the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Um, uh, good to talk to you all, and uh, thanks for having me on, Seamus. Say goodbye, Seamus. Goodbye, Seamus. Goodbye, Seamus.